Well, everybody, welcome back to the Bible Breakdown Podcast with your host, Pastor Brandon, today, 1 Samuel chapter 18. And if I give this one a title, it would simply be, Envy Destroys Everything. Envy Destroys Everything. I heard a story of a friend of mine who said that his daughter was a, um, she she was in volleyball, and she played volleyball all the time, and she said her team wasn't very good, but they loved to play, and it was a wonderful environment. And they entered into this tournament. And as they were playing this tournament, they didn't even expect to get out of the first round, but they did. And they got in the next round. And they got in the next round. It was just going really, really well. And they knew they were going to be in this collision course with this other team that everybody expected to win. I mean, they were just number one the whole way. And there, was, there wasn't any fun on that side. It was just expectation on that side. Well, on my friend's side, it was just it was a good time, right? They just enjoyed it. And they said that when they got to it, that they ended up losing the championship match. The team that was supposed to win won, and their team came in second. But they were just so happy to be there that they were just excited, and they were having a great time, and they were just thankful to be there. And they celebrated so much that the winner's team coach came to my friend's team coach and was mad. Can you stop celebrating so much? We won. And they're like, we know, congratulations. We're just happy to be here. And this coach didn't know what to do with that. So they, their whole team got so angry that they didn't even stay for the ceremony. They left because they were so envious and angry at the happiness of the second place team. They didn't know what to do with it. And that reminds me so much of this story because what we're going to find today is David has won a great victory. He has killed Goliath, and they've conquered the Philistines. And Saul should be very happy. He's still king. Everything's still going. But because people want to celebrate somebody else, Saul doesn't know what to do with that, and it starts to mess things up. We're going to get into that more in just a moment. But as always, if you like what we're doing here, make sure you like, share, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thank you so much for watching every day. It means the world to me that we get a chance to spend some time together every day. If you are listening on the podcast, you are always my favorites. Don't let anybody else tell you different. (laughs) I love that we get a chance to read God's Word together and just, just enjoy being together and just gushing about God's Word. Your friendly Bible nerd is always here for you. (laughs) And then as always, we love just to gather together around just God's Word through our Facebook group discussion, Bible breakdown discussion. Make sure you go there. Let us know how you were interacting with God's Word, because I'm telling you, the more we dig, the more we find, and especially in chapter 18. So if you have your Bibles, you want to get them ready for me, this idea is just another chapter of the overall idea in 1 Samuel that God's providence, despite our silliness or our foolishness. God has anointed Saul. Saul has lost all of that. He's still king, but he's lost the anointing of God on that kingship. It is passed on to David, but Saul is still the king. And this a wonderful victory has just got through happening. You know, David has killed Goliath. The Philistines have been pushed back. This is a chance for everyone to celebrate. But Saul can't handle, he's very insecure. He can't handle when someone else gets celebrated. And so he starts to slowly plot against David. But what's amazing is even through all of that, God has not given up on them. And very, very slowly, he is moving this piece here, moving that piece there, and still orchestrating everything. But this is also the beginning of a very difficult season for David. So let's read this together, and let's see what God's word would say to us through his word. Let's let's go. Verse 1 says this. After David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, the king's son, and there was an immediate bond between them, for Jonathan loved David. And from that day on, Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let him return home. And Jonathan made a solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robe and giving it to David, and together with his tunic, sword, bow, and belt. Whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. So Saul made him the commander over the men of war, an appointment that was welcomed by the people of Saul's officers all alike. And when the victorious Israelite army was returning home from David had killed the Philistine, women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul, and they sang and danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals. So pause for a second. What happened was, is while they're on this campaign, there would be many days of war pushing them back, and David just continued to distinguish himself. After he killed 
Goliath, he would go back out with them, and he would start to fight. And so David was put over the armies, and everybody loved it. They thought it was great. And so Jonathan, David's now new best friend, he sees them, and he's like, I love this guy. There's something different about this guy. I want to get to know this guy. And so he said, hey, you're going to marry my sister. You're one of the family. And so he put on those kingly robes on him, gave him some of the finest weaponry, and he just became his best friend. So everything's going well until they get back home. And the Bible said that when these women are welcoming him back home, they sang a song, and it was this. Saul has killed his thousands, and David his ten thousands. This made Saul very angry. What's this, he said? They've credited David with his ten thousands and me with only thousands? Next, they'll be making him their king. And from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. That very next day, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul. And he began to rave in his house like a madman. David was playing the harp as he did each day, but David or Saul, but Saul had a spear in his hand and suddenly hurled it at David, intending to pin him to the wall. But David escaped him twice. Pause. Now I'm gonna tell you something. You're gonna throw a spear at me once, okay. You gonna throw a spear at me twice? <laughs> David is a better man <laughs> than all of us. You throw a spear at him twice, and he's still hanging around. Verse 12. Saul was then afraid of David, for the Lord was with David and had turned away from Saul. So in other words, Saul has now realized that, man, I tried to kill this guy twice and I can't kill him. God is with David. Verse 13, finally, Saul sent him away and appointed him commander over a thousand men, and David faithfully led his troops into battle. David continued to succeed in everything he did, for the Lord was with him. And when Saul recognized this, he became even more afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he was so successful at leading his troops into battle. One day, Saul said to David, I am ready to give you my older daughter, Merab, as your wife. But first, you must prove yourself by being a real warrior and by fighting the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, I'll send him out against the Philistines and let them kill him rather than me doing it myself. Who am I? And what is my family in Israel that I should be the king's son-in-law? David exclaimed. My father's family is nothing. So when the time came for Saul to give daughter, his daughter Merab to marriage to David, he gave her instead to Adriel, the man of Manoah. M- M- Meloah. <laughs> Verse 20. In the meantime, Saul's daughter Michal had fell in love with David. And Saul was delighted when he heard about it. Here's another chance for me to kill David by the Philistines. Saul said this as a way to prove what he wanted to do. But David said again, today you have a second chance to become a son-in-law. Then Saul told his men to say to David, the king really likes you and so do we. Why don't you accept the king's offer and become his son-in-law? And when Saul's men heard said these things to David, he replied, How can a poor man from a humble family afford a bride price for the daughter of a king? And when Saul's men reported this back to the king, he told them, Tell David that all I want for the bride price is the hundred Philistine foreskins. Lord, help us. Vengeance on my enemies is all I really want. But what Saul had in mind was that David would be killed in the fight. David was delighted to accept this offer. Before the time limit expired, he and his men went out and killed 200 Philistines. Then David fulfilled the king's requirement by presenting all their foreskins to him. So Saul gave his daughter Michal to David to be his wife. When Saul realized that the Lord was with David and how much his daughter Michal loved him, David became even more afraid of him, and he remained David's enemy for the rest of his life. Every time the commanders of the Philistines attacked, David was more successful against them than all the rest of Saul's officers. And so David became very famous. So as we can see, David is slowly gaining more and more recognition because the Lord is with him. And Saul notices. And this envy inside of Saul is ruining what could be a very fruitful time in his life. And now, we're not even going to talk about the fact that he asked for 200 or for 100 foreskins. If you don't know what it is, don't Google it. Go ask an old person, <laughs> and they'll tell you what that is. So not only did he have to kill them, but he had to um, perform surgery on them as well. And he did. He and his men did. So it just shows that David was awesome. <laughs> but what I am so sad about in this 
is sometimes one of the worst things that can happen is when we are unable to see what God is doing in our life because we're comparing our life to somebody else. I heard someone say one day that the biggest problem we face is our own hearts. And the way to tell how our heart is, is what do we do? How do we react when our enemies are blessed? How do we react when our enemies are blessed? You know, if we can celebrate when our enemies are blessed, then we know that our heart is tender and pure before God. But if we find ourselves getting angry, getting frustrated, God, how could you? Why would you? Then we begin to realize that maybe there's something going on in our own hearts. And so I want to ask you this question. How do you respond when your enemies are blessed? Are you able to not be excited about it, but hey, you know what? Praise the Lord. Or does it mess you up? If so, then maybe there's some unforgiveness there that God wants to deliver you from. Because if you have unforgiveness against somebody else, then you're giving them control in your life. And God wants only himself to lead you. He doesn't want the actions or opinions or points of view of others to lead you. So I want to ask you one more time, how do you react when your enemy is blessed? Well, whatever that is, let's take it to the Lord today. Allow him to heal us of any broken place so that we can celebrate because their victory has nothing to do with us. God, he, he has the ability to bless them and to bless us at the same time. We just need to trust the Lord and trust that the Lord knows what he's doing. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to read your word. Thank you that your word is truth. And thank you that you're able to lead us in all things. Lord, I pray you will help us to have a tender heart, to realize, God, that you are for us in all things. Forgive us, Lord, of how we sometimes compare ourselves to others, to realize that we've never been more loved than we are right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, don't forget God's word says in 1 Samuel chapter 12, be sure to fear the Lord and faithfully serve him. Think of all the wonderful things he has done for you. God is for you and not against you. God has a plan for your life and nothing is going to stop him from making it happen. I love you. I'll see you tomorrow for 1 Samuel chapter 19. 